Ik wil u graag van harte welkom heten. Mijn naam is Arjen Clement en ik ben voorzitter van het nieuwe werkgenootschap van Nederland. Dat al sinds 2000 ook betrokken is bij de Alliance of European Republican Movement. En om de zoveel jaar wordt het ook toegeurs gewijzigd, worden er ergens vergaderd in een van de landen en wij waren dit jaar aan de beurt. We zijn een dag bezig op dit moment en morgen is er nog een halve dag om tot conclusies te komen en de planning voor de komende periode vorm te geven. We hebben gasten uit zeven landen, die gaan hier straks op een stoel hun land vertegenwoordigen. En we hebben een gastenspreker en die zal Jan Jacques Jan weer introduceren. Thank you. Well, uh, we're very <coughs> pleased to have uh, Thomas van der Dunk uh, uh, to uh, give a short introduction, uh, which will form a bridge to what we discussed this morning as it comes to the discrepancies between the image of the benign king on the one hand and reality on the other hand, and how to deal with that uh, to get to the hearts and minds of uh, the people <coughs> who want a democratic change. Uh, Thomas van der Dunk is a historian, he is a publicist, he is very well known, but especially in the Netherlands, so I think for the Danish, Swedish, uh, English, uh, Belgian, uh, Spanish uh, groups, I think I have to introduce him in some, well, very short way. A uh, historian, uh, publicist on quite a lot of uh, themes, under which uh, monarchy, and um, uh, there were many, many persons very, uh, uh, well, enthusiastic about his way of dealing with uh, the myths surrounding it. I think there's hardly anyone to be found who is more able to uh, demolish the myth of the benign king than Thomas von der Dunk. <laughs> uh, we have yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Well, uh, I was asked to tell something about the myth and reality of the monarchies still existing in Europe. Uh, that's not a very simple thing, I think, because I don't know as much of every country of the seven still existing monarchies in Europe, still existing seven bigger monarchies. Uh, apparently, Luxembourg, Monaco, and Liechtenstein weren't seen as important enough to be Mm -hmm. well, represented here. <laughs> I don't know how they think about them themselves, but uh, so it's only about the countries uh, which are a little bit bigger, the seven bigger European monarchies, United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Belgium, Norway, Sweden, Denmark and Spain. Uh, what I want to do is in fact to say something about three main myths which are connected to those monarchies and to those monarchal dynasties. The first is that they have something to do with stability and democracy, or that those countries, those seven countries, uh, are stable and democracies, are stable democracies thanks to the fact that they are monarchies. The second is that I want to say something about how national those monarchal dynasties are, and the third is how deep-rooted as such uh, those dynasties are in those countries. Uh, as I told, seven bigger European monarchies still resting. All the other countries in Europe, so over 30 or 40 perhaps, are republics. 200 years ago, this was the reverse at that moment. 200 years ago, 1815, only Switzerland, which started as a republic, was still a republic, and later France, which had been a republic for a short while after the French Revolution, became a republic again. New countries in the 19th century always became kingdoms, uh, not always quite automatically. Greece, when they start, they start as a republic, but they after a few years became a kingdom, and in Belgium they discuss the fact if they want to start as a republic, 
Republic of Republic. And then after a half a year or something like that, they, they decided to become a kingdom. The revolutionaries who, who revolted against the Netherlands in 1830. Uh, the reason for that is because the Republic as an idea was, well, was, uh, was seen very negative thanks to the to the French Revolution and through the, the extremities the French Revolution had led to. After 1792, when the French monarchy was transformed in French Republic, uh, the first, perhaps you can say, the first monarchy to be transversed in a republic, uh, apart from the Commonwealth Cromwell in England, one century before, uh, they founded a lot of new republics automatically when they conquered other countries and they, and they start to conquer half of Europe soon after 1792, they, um, they founded a lot of new republics. Uh, uh, so at that moment, this was the normal fact, but after Napoleon had, became, so had made himself emperor, uh, all those republics were exchanged for new monarchies. Uh, Till the First World War, all countries, all new countries came to exist into existence in Europe became monarchies. I think the last was Albania, who just had one monarch in the whole time it existed, and then became a communist dictatorship. Uh, things changed, thanks to the First World War. Uh, the First World War meant the fall of a lot of important monarchies, the Dutch the, 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 German, the German Empire, the Austrian Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, uh, and the new states that came into existence when those, when those empires were, were split up became automatically republics. I've never heard that there was somebody in Estonia or in Slovakia at that moment thinking about the possibility to become a kingdom or a monarchy at that time. That was, for that time, a very modern, I would say. Uh, the, the modern society with democracy, with, uh, with an extra voteship for everybody, uh, that wasn't to bring an accomplishment, to, to make together, to bring together with the idea of a monarchy. Uh, there were no natural dynasties to, to take hold of. Uh, even Hungary still stayed to become stayed officially a monarchy, but never had a monarch anymore. They had an admiral uh, for the while during the during the period between the first and the second world war. But officially, it stayed a monarchy, but the monarch was gone. So in fact, it was a, it was a dictatorship of presidency. Uh, after the second world war, thanks to the the rising of communism thanks to the conquest of Eastern Europe by the Soviets, also a lot of resting monarchies at the Balkans, Yugoslavia, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, uh, were, uh, were gone and became a republic. And in Italy, the people themselves decided uh, to make uh, of the Italian kingdom a, a, a republic because the Italian king hadn't been able uh, to, 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 uh, to get rid of Mussolini. Uh, apart from that, in Spain, because of the Civil War, in Greece later, and in Portugal also, the, the monarchy is vanquished. All seven still existing monarchies are constitutional monarchies, constitutional democracies, and uh, with the exception of Spain, all those uh, monarchies already are for a long time functional democracies, at least with uh, a vote for everybody since circa 1920, it depends on the country where you look. Uh, but yeah, at least a parliamentary system is existing in the Scandinavian countries and in the, in the Benelux countries, so I take Luxembourg with it now, and uh, United Kingdom, uh, at least since the middle of the 19th century, functioning. Although you have to say that the United Kingdom with the, with the House of Lords in fact still has a very undemocratic relict of, I mean say, of the Middle Ages. Uh, in a way it doesn't exist 
anywhere that you can be for a lifetime and also because of hereditary, because of your, where you depend, where you, uh, because your, your, your hair, of, in fact, as a hair, you get it, uh, that you get it uh, just because your father was a member and your grandfather, and also that bishops are member automatically of the Anglican Church, of the, of the Parliament. Uh, this is a very, a very strange exception in the European democracies, and it has to do with the fact that, uh, as an explanation, that uh, England, in England, in the United Kingdom, there never was some revolution or some threat of a revolution since Cromwell, uh, and they also never were conquered. I think it's a pity that the uh, United Kingdom was never conquered by Napoleon. Uh, well, somebody, of course, had to defeat Napoleon in the end, therefore we needed the British. But for Britain itself, I think it would have been much better to become a modern state, uh, to get a global constitution and a lot of other things. Uh, when it was once conquered, then they would also have gone rid of those miles and pounds and whatever they still have, pounds and, and gallons, uh, and would be understandable for the rest of Europe. Uh, but uh, apart from that, uh, or as you say, that six of those seven countries have a long constitutional parliamentary tradition, and in Spain, uh, this is rather short. Only 40 years now, 40, uh, in the end of uh, December, it will be 40 years that, uh, ago that Franco died. And of course, there was also a parliamentarian system in Spain in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, but you can't compare its functioning uh, with the way it already functioned in the northwestern countries, northwestern European countries, which are still monarchies. I mean, it's, I think it's not an accident that. Those countries in Northwestern Europe are still uh, are the most stable countries, stable, stable democracies, uh, and that they are monarchies. But what is the relationship? Uh, a lot of monarchists say, well, those countries are stable because they are monarchies. I would say it's the reverse. Because they are stable, they are still a monarchy. There never had been a reason enough, there had never been reason enough to make republics of that. And that's the paradox one can say because the power of those monarchs in those six countries in the northwest of Europe uh, was gradually diminished. I mean they are of course all have all been autocrats in the in the beginning, but the beginning is sometimes long ago. Uh, it is gradually diminished, and the more they lost power, uh, at least officially power, the less they could influence things for the better or the worse, and could be held uh, responsible for big mistakes and big, big failures. So I would say just because those countries had become uh, stable democracies, they still are monarchies, and the monarch had lost with every new, you can, at least if you look at Holland, but I think it is, in most countries it will be the case, that with every new generation, in practice, the power of the monarch is further limited, officially, and uh, that means that, well, if something goes totally wrong, you cannot hold the monarch responsible. Uh, if you compare, if you look at what happened at the end of the First World War, uh, William II, the, the German Emperor, could be held responsible also officially for what went wrong with Germany. They lost the war. That's a good reason to get rid of the government if you lose the war. Uh, well, uh, we lost, of course, uh, we have lost three wars, I would say, in the last two centuries against the Belgians. Uh, against the Germans, we, uh, we have lost that war in 1940, that we still exist, it's not thanks to the Dutch to themselves, but thanks to the Americans who liberated us, and we lost the war of the Indonesians, but in, each, in, this, in both the last two cases, you cannot hold the monarch responsible for that, 
In the first you can, in the case of the the of, of losing the war of of with Belgium, you can help responsible uh, King William the First because of his politics against the Belgians, and he was also held responsible for that, and it is one of the reasons that he resigned after 10 years when he had to accept that the Netherlands had lost Belgium. Uh, so the, and that's the difference with, with, uh, with, with something, somebody like uh, the, the German Emperor William II, uh, who could be held responsible, and well, when the whole empire crumbled down, he had to go. He was forced to go. It was also uh, strictly demanded by the by the enemy, by the by the French, and by the by the English, and by the Americans that he had to go. Well, that wasn't the case in 1940. That wasn't the case with our wars against Indonesia. Uh, you can compare it a bit, perhaps, with the fate of Leopold III after the Second World War, uh, because he stayed in Belgium. He was uh, held responsible for collaboration, and that because of that he was forced to go as a person. Uh, and we know that uh, depending on if you were Walloon or Flemish in Belgium, you were against or uh, or before the, against uh, or, or supporting the monarchy as such. So there was discussion because here the the the, the monarch had made himself very much. Uh, much, much mistakes. Uh, so, to say, to 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 to, uh, to put it together, uh, because those countries are stable monarch uh, democracies, they are stable monarchies. How did those democracies came into existence? Well, now often it's said the king is uh, is thanks thanks to the kings themselves that. Those countries are democracies. Well, that of course is rubbish. <laughs> uh, in nearly each case, the monarch has resisted uh, when his power was reduced. Uh, that in 1848 in Holland, the Dutch king, in one night, turned over from, as was said, from, con from conservative to liberal, uh, is. One, on the one hand, because he feared the revolution around in Europe, happening around, so he decided, I have to give, give way, I have to make concessions. And on the other hand, that uh, modern, modern biography has now made clear he was uh, blackmailed because of his, uh, and that he's not the last, the first one, because of his uh, sexual uh, behavior. He was blackmailed for that uh, by some liberals who said, well, if you don't agree with, then we will uh, make this clear to the people, and then you will have a big, much bigger problem. But in most countries, also in those seven, in those seven, uh, seven constitutional monarchies, the power of the parliament always had to be conquered on the king, on behalf of the king. Uh, and he never was very willing to give up power. The first monarch we had in Holland, William I, was in fact the most, uh, most autocratic uh, person we ever had governing our country since it came into existence in the rebellion against Spain. And also perhaps in the Belgian vision, the Belgian perspective, also William the First will be held, will be seen as the most autocratic, autocratic uh, man ever governing Belgium, more autocratic than later <coughs> the First when he built the Second. He also had to handle under other circumstances. I mean, Leopold the First always knew that he he was chosen, so to say, by the Belgian elite to become a king in a, you know, in a country he didn't know till yet, till that. Uh, so he perhaps was a little bit more, 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 more decent in this respect. Uh, but I think that in, in whatever country you look, uh, also in England, uh, United Kingdom, uh, where the 
power of the monarchs is reduced very gradually since the Middle Ages. It was always against the will of the monarchs that they lost their power. Uh, and the democracy had to conquer, had to be conquered on behalf of the monarchy. So that's the first myth. Uh, that's, uh, and if you look at the behavior, well, you have just to, 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 to look in, in the journals, if you look at the behavior of monarchs today, and you see how easy they handle with dictators, uh, marry perhaps also with, the, with, with people, uh, with families who are not very democratic. I mean, we have the problem in Holland, but there are examples enough of that to be, 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 be said, uh, as we talked about. Uh, you can say that the uh, are Democrats, inborn Democrats, as soon as they are outside their own country, they often behave totally otherwise. And uh, the fact that on important at important marriages, also other monarchs, monarchs who are all who are monarchical dynasties, who, all, who don't reign anymore, always are invited, or mostly are invited, and those other dynasties lost their power mostly because they didn't want to give up some of their power. Uh, then you can say that uh, that the most monarchs are inborn Democrats. So that's the, that's the first I want to state about the myth, myth of, uh, of uh, monarchy and democracy, that, it's, you know, that's, that we are democracies, thanks to the fact that we are monarchies. Uh, the second is about how national, how national are those dynasties. Uh, one has to know, of course, that some of those six, of those seven kingdoms are rather new and other are old. I mean, United Kingdom, Denmark, and Sweden are, have always existed as a kingdom since the Middle Ages. United Kingdom, of course, as a fusion, fusion between England and Scotland, but you can say that is, they are always, have always been kingdoms. But it doesn't mean that a dynasty, which is which is reigning, is also already inborn since the Middle Ages. In England, the dynasty they have now came 1714 from Germany, the House of Hanover. They are now called the House of Windsor, but uh, that is because of the First World War. Then they fought fighting the Germans to, uh, to have the name of a German, German town as their as a dynastical house. Would be very, very very good. Uh, in Denmark, you can say the House of Holstein at least is from nearby. Schleswig Holstein is, is border region of Denmark and, and Germany. And in Sweden, they have the House of Bernadotte, which is a French general of Napoleon who took over Sweden. So not so in Rus dynasty. Uh, Norway, in the Middle Ages, had been a kingdom, but we then became, by a personal union, first part of Denmark, and then after Napoleon, part of Sweden. And when it became a separate state again, 95, it became a kingdom again. And then they chose a Danish dynasty. They chose just uh, the second son or something like that of the, of the, of the Danish king as their own king. Uh, with a, with a, uh, but they did as if they were continuing, at least this king <coughs> took a new name, took a Norwegian Norwegian name, Hoken. Uh, I think he, he just was called Christian before or something like that. But to make himself more Norwegian, he took a Norwegian name. And he wasn't Hoken the first, but Hoken the seventh. As, and so suggesting that he was just a successor of the last, uh, the last independent Norwegian king in the 14th century or something like that. Holland is a case apart because Holland came into existence as a state, and in this case it's, it's just, uh, otherwise with uh, the Scotland, England, uh, and the three Scandinavian countries. Uh, the Netherlands came into existence as a state, as a republic, thanks to a rebellion against Spain, as you know. Uh, and then they had, they had 
it's not from the beginning quite clear. It's, it's a kind of development. Then they had some foreign family who by, also by accident, in fact, uh, one of them had become stadtholder here, William the Silent, stadtholder of the, of the Spanish king, and stayed here, and his, uh, well, his sons uh, became after him stadtholder, uh, had always to be elected, uh, only hereditary became in the, in the 18th century, uh, and officially they weren't, they weren't reigning the country, but they were in fact servants of the states of the Dutch Republic. Uh, so they are civil servants in a way, but hereditary civil servants, which as such in that at that moment wasn't very strange as also burgomasters always very often also from father to son uh, inherited uh, their position. And then they were, then in, in 71, uh, the last of those dynasty died and then some other dynasty, which, well, it was related, but all, the, all, all royal families are related. That's another, another point. <laughs> if we're talking about, about national, I mean, it's very much incest uh, is about it in this, in this respect. Uh, that's uh, another grand, another part of this, of this dynasty, well, a uh, grand nephew or something like that, from Frisia, from the small uh, prophet of Frisia came to the Hague and then since that and now they are called the Orangists. Uh, they were gone in 1795 thanks to the French and came back 1813 as a king. Uh, but not in fact thanks to themselves but thanks to Napoleon otherwise he'll say something more about that. Uh, so that's a very strange development in the Netherlands. In Belgium they started just by revolting against the, the, the Dutch, as we as Dutch start to our state by revolting against the Spanish, and then after that just looked around. Well, who the hell wants to become king of our country? <laughs> uh, and it took some time till they did find Leopold, uh, who was hesitating very much to do this, also because he was Lutheran and Bel the Belgians are Catholic, uh, uh, to become king of this country. So this dynasty, of course, isn't, it's a German dynasty coming from what's now the eastern part of Germany. It isn't deeply rooted in, in the Belgian country. Well, then the last is Spain, which of course had been a kingdom before, also a kingdom that came into existence because of the fusion of, the, of two other kingdoms, and then became a republic, and then, thanks to Franco, so that was not a democratic choice of the people, then thanks to Franco, was decided, well, that the king should return, at least uh, the royal dynasty should return, and then uh, so, so matter of it became king. Well, the Bourbons, the name already says it, are all those, so not very Spanish, but French, but also. all those dynasties claiming that they are very national, in fact, by accident, mostly by accident now, reigning dynasty, came into those countries, and, well, uh, if if it would be just have a little bit uh, went a little bit else, it would have ended elsewhere. Uh, if you look how easy, still in the 19th century, but before even more, uh, was dealt about countries saying, well, if you give me this country, I can become king of your country, etc. Uh, you can say that there is a in a connection, moral connection between these monarchs and the countries they are, they are reigning. Uh, the elector of Bavaria, elector is not real king, but near king, elector of Bavaria in the 18th century just thought about exchanging Belgium, Bavaria against Belgium to give Bavaria to the Austrian emperor and to get uh, in reach of Belgium because it was perhaps more profitable. Uh, this was very normal till the French Revolution. Uh, the countries were seen as the, well, as, as the, 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 the possessions of the kings, which they could deal with as, as like as you deal with some, 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 uh, some house or something like that. This changed in the 19th century, and only in the 19th century, all those 
dynasties who by accident had ended up where they had ended up now uh, were forced to show themselves to be very nationalistic and very deeply rooted and to and had to try to prove that they were uh, very near related to the country they in fact by accident were governing uh, to say it simple uh, till the French Revolution the criterion was not the people but the monarch in fact the monarch made the country could divide the country could make the country bigger by 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 marrying uh, the queen somewhere else and then you have a bigger country so Spain came into existence uh, since the French Revolution that's of course the start of democratic thinking uh, you first had in fact the people that was the criterion and well then you perhaps and, and if you decide we are a people who came, you start to revolt, thanks to the thing about the Greece, the Greeks or the or the, the Belgians. And uh, then after that you decide, well, we have to make another country, and then we have to look perhaps for monarch. And this monarch just become uh, became a letter, uh, totally uh, unexpected. Who do we want to become our, our monarch? And uh, so he always, there was nothing natural rooted in it, he always had, well, uh, he had to do, he had to make a big job to make clear that he, he, he had some inner relationship with this country. If you only look at the Dutch oranges, which were after two centuries thrown away in 1795, the later King William I became uh, became a, a prince of Fulda, which is a German princeship, French Napoleon. Uh, uh, he, if he had been offered Salzburg or, or, the, the, or the Austrian throne or the, the Russian throne, he had also had said yes. There was nothing special about that he, he, he especially liked Fulda or something like that. No, he just wanted something to have as a compensation. In 1813, uh, when he came back, uh, in fact the same was the case. Uh, he wanted uh, as big a country as possible. So he wanted, and that was made the English very angry, he won't, only wanted Belgium, he also, also wanted the German Rhineland. Not because of some national concept connected to, to his own dynasty, but just because then he had more power. When his son, William II, in 1813 returned as the, uh, as the heir to the throne, to throne in the Netherlands, he didn't see himself as Dutch. If he was anything, he was either Prussian in his own eyes or English. He had, was born in Holland, but had gone, was gone, had to fly uh, when he was two years old. So he had no relationship, emotional or whatever, with the country he was supposed to govern later <coughs> at all. Uh, Leopold the first, first king of Belgium, twenty years before was. Uh, trying to marry the, the the daughter of the English king, and so hoping, of course, to become the, the prince consort of England, also not quite the same as Belgium. Uh, in most countries, during the 19th century and later, the elite and the new monarchs themselves had to do very much and that you can say is a kind of eventual tradition to make clear or to suggest that they were very nearly connected to the history of the country they were governing. Uh, that we have Queen's Day was, is also only invented at the end, and now King's Day is only invented at the end of the 19th century for that reason. Before that, and that's also about the Dutch for the report for, for understanding those monarchies like the Belgian and the Dutch one. Uh, that uh, I will go to an end now. Okay. Uh, that till, uh, till the French Revolution, in fact there were only a very few monarchies uh, in Europe and it wasn't easy to make a new one. In fact, it was impossible. The only who had the right to do so was the German, the Emperor, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And this changed with Napoleon, who made himself emperor, 
and also create just for his brothers <coughs> uh, new throats, just just out of the gutter, so to say. Uh, very simple, and also uh, got rid of them when he thought, well, this brother is just isn't acting as uh, as he should. Uh, uh, to, to, to much independence. And also the Dutch throne, and that was our problem, I say that's the, the point with the, with the try out to, to remember the, the uh, uh, we, 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 have, we have celebrated 200 years monarchy in 1813, 2013, which of course is nonsense because the monarchy starts in 86 here. That William the first could become a king was because there was something, somebody before him, and that was just the brother of the of the French emperor, and he made more or less the monarchy acceptable after two years, two centuries of, of republic, uh, acceptable for the Dutch people. Uh, so, and that's in fact what the Orangists here always try to hide is that their monarchy. They, that, that their monarchy wasn't thanks to themselves, but uh, not rooted in their tradition, but in fact just a creation uh, by a foreign power, by, a, by the French emperor, to help his brother, or to help himself in fact, to give, to, to give the Dutch his brother as a king. Uh, and uh, this is in fact a big taboo still in Dutch history, uh, and also to talk about that. Uh, and so everybody is doing as if the monarchy is, is coming to exist from 1813, whereas it's older and had nothing to do with the dynasty. So also this makes clear that this autom automatically connection uh, between dynasty, monarchy, and country in the case of the of the Netherlands is a big nonsense. Uh, that it started otherwise. And that when, that's, uh, that's the, the first myth of 83. The second myth is, but in fact I have already said something about that, the second myth is that, uh, that in 813 the start of our parliamentary democracy. I think that's the biggest nonsense because the start of the monarchy was the most authoritarian period in the Dutch history. Uh, as well with William Napoleon, so the role of Napoleon, as with uh, as with William the First himself, uh, but it uh, it is accepted by the by, by the by the politicians as a fact, although it's not a fact at all, and this this has to do with a lack of historical knowledge, uh, which is a problem of the of of the Netherlands especially. Uh, uh, I think I have said, I was also looking at the time, I think I've said the most important things now uh, about the myth regarding the monarchies in Europe that is, has something to do with democracy, that democracy is there thanks to the monarchy, that they are very near connected with the nation they govern, no, it's off by accident that they are have ended up in the country they govern they reign now, and the first that it is very deep rooted. Uh, mostly those dynasties are rather young compared <coughs> to the country they govern. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs> So, if I may summarize, uh, Thomas, thank you for your. Uh, if I may summarize it, uh, once we get Republican introduced, uh, we have history on our side. So, there uh, can be any reason to be reluctant in this uh, in relation to arguments uh, from history. It's all coinciding, coincidental. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the people from uh, the different countries to take a seat over here and uh, see if uh, we can uh, get questions of the audience and uh, Danish, uh, Swedish, uh, British, uh, Belgian and Dutch uh, and Spanish. Um, who have <laughs> uh,
No, wait, no, wait, sorry. Uh, so. This is for the audience, especially everything you always wanted to know about uh, European democracies being still in a monarchy, but we're afraid to ask. And this is the moment uh, to ask it. So if you want to know something about the Scottish system, if you want to know about uh, the background of, uh, for example, uh, the situation in Spain, uh, if you want to know about the future of Belgium uh, under a Republican leadership, this is the moment to ask. I think at the first uh, instance it might be uh, wise to ask something about uh, any one of you wanted to react about Thomas' uh, 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 Thomas' speech in the first place. For example, Graham, uh, how about the invasion of uh, Britain by Napoleon and the United States? Just mention something. Yeah. Um, we have a, is that on? Is that on? Yeah. Um, being governed by Europeans isn't a very popular idea. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> in Britain, um, particularly the French, if I don't mind saying so, but um, I, I, the myths thing is quite interesting. I agree, um, the, the thing about the stability, I mean, that's the line that we've always used, that um, it is the other way around. It's the stable countries where the monarchies have survived. For us, there's, there's three key myths which I think sort of tie in, which is that people see the monarchy as, um, as unifying the country, which I think it comes back to the, the stability thing. I think the unification thing is a, a kind of a way of saying everyone else supports it, so you should too. Um, and then they think that it's powerless. They think it's, it's essentially a non-political, powerless and harmless institution. And then finally, they, they think it's good for money, uh, good value for money. They think it's good for tourism, uh, it's good for the economy, and so on. And those three myths are quite powerful in the sense that it, it, if you wrap them up together, it says that the monarchy is, is harmless, everyone loves it, and is, and is putting money in our pockets. So, you know, there's no problem to, to resolve. So we do try and, uh, and tackle those. The unity one is, is, is harder to tackle, I think, but apart from showing that actually lots of people don't support it, um, the, the tourism and economic one is easier to tackle in the sense that there's no evidence to support it. Um, and the power one is the one I think that um, surprises most people because our monarchy in Britain does have um, quite a lot of power to their own power to protect and advance their own interests. So they're not making um, political decisions, but they're certainly interfering in secret uh, to protect and advance their own interests. They do actually have the power, any law that goes through Parliament in Britain that affects the private interests of Charles or the Queen, they are required to give consent to that law to go through. Which means that the law will always go through, but it will be tailored and written in a way that always um, exempts them from taxes or gives them special privileged uh, treatment. So, um, yeah, they do have quite a lot of power in that sense. Uh, so it was interesting, and I, I always, when I hear that story, I feel such sadness on behalf of Holland that it was once a republic. That's such a beautiful <laughs> story. It came into being as a republic. You're all I, suffering I, from a trauma, trauma, you could say. Yeah, yeah I feel so sorry for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and it's a good, very good argument that you came into being as a republic. Um, and I think you called it House of Holstein. You mean the Glücksburg, right? Yeah, it's yeah. also part of the House of Holstein. It is, it is. Okay, right, you know, right? the, the Glücksburg family, and, and in Denmark, one of the ways to legitimate the kingdom, the, the monarchy, is to say that we're the oldest kingdom in the world, which I very much doubt there could be arguments for other arguments, I suppose, and also that uh, her family, Margaret's family, has ruled since uh, a thousand years, which is also like an argument. And if you, if you know about genetics, all of us will be related to the medieval king or the, or the, the first king a, a thousand years ago. So it's a lot of rubbish. Uh, but maybe, maybe that particular royal family is a little bit older, been there a little bit more. But, um, but mostly, it's so sad you're not a republic. <laughs> I think there will hardly be anyone here who is agreeing with this. Uh, it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, Jenny, why don't you... Oh, do you want me to say something? Yeah, then, well, we get a kind of, uh, you know, uh, overall picture and then I ask uh, the audience. Yeah. Well, 
Sometimes in Sweden, well, you said we've been a, demo uh, a monarchy um, Which since country, by the way? Sweden. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking because sometimes in Sweden there are people saying we could still be a monarchy, but we could choose the king. We used to do that once in like 1530, I think was the last time we chose the king in Sweden. <laughs> so I mean, we've been a monarchy for many years, um, and I mean. The uh, king right now being from France, of course, Napoleon sent him, which is just stupid. Just a short comment. I um, I really like the lecture that you gave us. Oh, sorry, I'm Belen from Spain. I'm from the one of the many republicans, uh, one of the many <laughs> republican associations uh, in Spain, and. Um, um, it, uh, the Spanish history is quite controversial because we've been republic, uh, uh, we've been republican twice, and now we've got the Bourbon, as you said, uh, thanks to Franco, and now we are trying to get rid of it again. <laughs> That's why we are here, and um, it's quite difficult to try in, uh, to get back a republic after a civil war. So now um, we were talking before in our meeting about the, f the public feeling, about the public opinion. And um, before the, the former king application, talking about Republican streets, it was quite controversial because of the, uh, there are people who still uh, think about the civil war. It's, uh, the, but the Republic is an instability, it's, um, it's a danger. They are afraid of, of having a new civil war. But after the abdication and um, with all the public demonstrations in favor of having a referendum, whether we want a monarchy or a republic, um, at least now the republic issue is on the streets again. So it's not that, um, I don't know how to, you don't have to hide if you understand what I'm saying. And so we hopefully think that we can use that new opportunity uh, to get uh, or to get smaller the threat of the, the fear of the people about getting a new republic. So. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to make a round. So, Philip, if you uh, would like more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My name is Gunnar Brevik. I'm from the Norwegian Republican Movement. I would like to add um, one fact uh, back in 1905 when, uh, when Norway became independent from Sweden. Uh, we were at that time already a, a monarchy. We didn't have the choice to, uh, to establish a monarchy. It was emphasized by the government at that time that we was a monarchy, we are going to stay a monarchy. And the only thing they then at that time asked um, in the referendum was, do you accept that we bring in a person from Denmark to be our king? That was the referendum that the people could accept. We did not choose monarchy. <laughs> but it has been a myth that we, at that time, chose the king. Norway uh, was, uh, the Norwegian king was chosen by the people in the referendum. But it's not true. <laughs> Okay, um, mijn naam is Philippe Bekaert en ik zou met jullie Nederlands kunnen praten, want ja, ik kom er dus vandaan. Um, <laughs> but there is a problem with my speaking Dutch here. People don't understand my awful Flemish accent, so they ask me in German or in English. And I have to explain, you know, what I speak is Dutch too, but that's, so I'll stick to English. Um, so I come from the Belgian Republic movement. And um, there are two things I'd like to react to um, about Belgium. The first one is the, the national thing, uh, the fact that the monarchy is not a national one. Um, we have that in Belgium too, exactly, so that the, our um, the ruling family comes from uh, Germany originally. Um, but unfortunately for us Republicans, that doesn't seem to be a problem because we have no national identity, or we have many of them, or we don't know, we don't really know what we are. Um, so that that is a, um, a subject 
that is never really addressed. Um, you can you can hear about that in in other monarchies. You know, those guys are not from our midst, and and but, well, we never hear that in Belgium because, as you know, we we have a, a kind of a, a problem defining our own identity or identities. And the other thing is, um, you, our speaker, mentioned. Um, the Belgian revolutionaries after 1830, so after the, 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 the what we call the revolution and what you call the separation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> history is, is always a matter of perspective. Um, uh, the Belgian revolutionaries uh, discussed on whether Belgium should be a republic or a monarchy. And uh, uh, they, choose, they chose the monarchy um, also, for another reason than the one you mentioned, um, the guaranteeing powers of the new state um, were monarchies. And uh, so France was a monarchy at the time, and or was a monarchy again. In 1830, uh, France happened to be a monarchy. Uh, and uh, Great Britain was a monarchy. And, uh, and those were the guaranteeing powers of the new Belgian state. And that was also um, one of the reasons why the, the Belgian parliament at the time, or the National Congress it was called at the time, uh, opted for, for a monarchy instead of a republic. Uh, they were afraid that we wouldn't make our new state very popular if we chose for a, a not very popular uh, regime in Europe, because only uh, Switzerland was a, a republic and France had been a republic and all the other countries were monarchies, so that was one of the reasons. Um, and if you have questions later on, I can answer them either in English or in Dutch, if you understand my Dutch. Uh, one, one remark from Thomas. Yes. And well, in fact, of course, it was the problem of the Dutch Republic in 1780, 72, to get accepted as a republic, not only as a separate country, but also as a republic, and in, in a world of kings. It was so doubling it, the trouble. Yes, yes, it was doubling the trouble, and because a republic in the 19th century, thanks to the the extremities of the terror of the French Revolution was well was seen as negative. Uh, you had a problem to become a republic, so they chose for their own safety to become, become, exactly. become a monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, the strange thing in the, at the moment is with the Belgian monarchy that I would say from the outside it's the only one perhaps who are want to be Belgian mm -hmm. at the moment, at the time. I mean if Belgium come as a state to the end, it's the end of them. Uh, as such as, I mean, they have a very, uh, they are the own, they, have, they are the own ones whose whole existence is dependent on the further existence of Belgium. Mm -hmm. So they are very pro-Belgian, I would say, of the monarchies. They have, they have an argument for that. They want to keep their job. They, they want to keep their job. <laughs> that's very understandable. Uh, Okay, this yes. might be a good uh, bridge towards the uh, questions of uh, the audience. Uh, if you want to put a question, I'll bring you the microphone, and uh, that might be the best uh, approach. First, I have a question for Mr. van der Donk. Yeah. You were mentioning that there was in our parliament a, a lack of knowledge of history. Yes. Uh, but I understand that the, the present king studied history in Leiden. So he, he himself must have, um, uh, because of that, a problem with accepting uh, the, the monarchy? Yes, yes. Well, uh, our uh, oh, minister is also an historian, yeah, yeah. but I've never <laughs> seen anything which was proving that he has studied history. Uh, and our former minister of uh, foreign relations, uh, the former former, uh, the, the last cabinet, Verhagen, also was a historian. But uh, no. Uh, yeah, he should know better. He should know better, but uh, it's a f it's it, it's uh, it's amazing fact that they uh, they totally neglect the the roots of the of the Dutch monarchy, uh, and this has to do with the fact that also the whole French period, as we call it, uh, was long seen as very negative, as occupation by the French, etc. I mean, it was after the Second World War. It was compared, it was compared to the German occupation, which of course is nonsense. Uh, so for that reason, uh, uh, they, they um, well, they tried, they tried to hide. I mean, we had now for the first time have three serious biographies about the first three Dutch kings: the Philip the First, the Second, and the Third. 
are vying about the first king of all, Louis Napoleon. Is it because it's paid by the Prince Baron Fonds? <laughs> uh, we don't know. Uh, that's the, that's uh, the, the, the most important uh, funding uh, uh, for. No, it's it's also because it's um, they, they, uh, everybody is going turning around it with a big in a big circle. It's too painful. Uh, if you go to one of the most the, the interesting thing is that the whole way the Dutch monarchy represented it itself was stolen from the French emperor. You have only to go to the to the Rijksmuseum to look at the uh, at the at the at the, uh, at the paintings of the, the, the official paintings of Napoleon and in the next uh, of, of William the First you see that he was copying him. And the the, the Palace of Soussdijk, which was given which was given on behalf of the Dutch people to the Crown Prince, the later King William the First. Second, because he had defeated Napoleon, or helped to, re helped to defeat Napoleon at Waterloo, uh, is, is from artist, art, uh, uh, from art historical point of view, is the most French palace we have in the whole of, of Holland. It's totally empire, it's totally empire. Uh, it's all, all French art, which you, which you are looking there. Uh, the Low, the Palace of the Low, which is another, was another famous palace, uh, after it was built by the Stadtholder King, so the, the king we share with the, with the, with the British, in the third, uh, the most important man who lived there and, and rebuilt it, in fact, was Louis Napoleon, uh, who, made, who, 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 made, who made the white, uh, uh, who plastered it, and who made the, the new park. Uh, by the big restorations in 1970, all is stripped off. And now it's a museum for the House of Orange. It's a museum which is talking about everybody who has lived there, everybody who lived there, not their own room, all the stadtholders, all the Dutch kings, except the most important of all kings for this palace, Louis Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> it's stripped, it's stripped, it's, it's gone over. It's taboo. It's, uh, can I uh, have an... Domnatio uh, Marmoria, would the Romans say. Can I have a question for the, the, the British uh, the representative? Uh, maybe you can help us. I understand that your royals had to pay tax. Have to pay tax? Yes, because uh, the, the, the reason that I said uh, our royals are uh, exempted from tax, and of course that means a bonus every year of about 300 million euros. And I think it would be nice if we can use that money ourselves by the moment. Um, well, the Queen doesn't have to pay tax, but um, she very kindly volunteered to do so about 20 years ago. Um, but won't tell us how much she's paying. Um, obviously paying at a voluntary rate, I and mean, I'm sure it's not the, um, the full amount. Um, Prince Charles, uh, also volunteers to pay tax um, and um, doesn't pay all the tax that he ought to be paying. So his income comes from something called the Duchy of Cornwall, which is a, um, a landed estate, um, has an income of around 18 million pounds a year. Um, and uh, he pays income tax on the little bit of that that he then gets given personally from the Duchy. Um, but doesn't pay corporation tax and doesn't pay capital gains tax, which any other organisation would. So he's, he's dodging an awful lot of tax. Um, and then, of course, the Dutchie then pays for an awful lot of his um, lifestyle. So, um, yeah, the, the others will pay tax, but um, uh, you know, we don't know what tax they're paying, and they've got all sorts of schemes of sort of you know, channeling the money around. Um, and. In particular, the inheritance tax they, they managed to avoid. So, uh, the rule is the the law is that a monarch uh, who comes to the throne inherits from their um, deceased former monarch doesn't pay inheritance tax. Um, but when the queen's mother died, that wasn't what was happening. It wasn't a monarch dying, but um, the prime minister nevertheless said, "Well, just don't worry about paying inheritance tax. Um, you can." You can keep the lot. So the Queen Mother, because um, this deal was done before she died, she said, well, in that case, I'm going to leave everything to the Queen, and you can then pass it around the rest of the family, so the whole family avoids uh, inheritance tax. So, yeah, they, they, do, they do pay tax, but they, 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 they fiddle it.
Thank you for that. May I ask a question? Is there was a change after the fire in that uh, castle and suddenly uh, people started to realize yeah. that everyone is paying uh, taxes but they don't and the uh, taxpayers had to pay for the repair because it was on insurance? Was that? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, 1992-93 um, they had a very bad year or two, they had divorces and separations um, yeah, and then someone accidentally set fire to Windsor Castle. Yeah. Um, government minister, yeah, government minister. The same night, while the firefighters were still trying to put the, the, the fire out, the government minister came out and said, "Well, of course, the taxpayer will pick up the bill." <laughs> um, the next morning, the taxpayer turned around and said, well, "Hang on a minute." Hey, I'm not so, about that. so, so yeah, they, um, uh, yeah, that's when they started and to that, uh, that's pay tax. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, anyone else from the public? Yeah. Hello. Um, what I hear are a lot, of, a lot of facts. Uh, History, historical facts. Uh, nevertheless, the royals in Holland are very, very popular, and they are even popular abroad. It's just that's something what we have to accept. Uh, and what I don't understand, and I heard it somewhere said, uh, people in charge in this country are walking around this problem. They are, they are, they are not facing this, this problem because I'm afraid. They are too afraid for an, <coughs> an electoral uh, uh, disaster. So maybe there are Democrats, uh, Republicans in the government, in the government of Holland or the previous government, but they still are not. Uh, sure. They don't have guts to, to tackle this problem. And seeing the people who are sitting here and two three days, there will be thousands and thousands outside of this uh, building. I think yeah. Where, how can you bring this information that we think is right out there? How can you explain? Come on, this is not democratic. What ha what's happening here in this country? Well, how? I, I don't hear. I don't hear this answer. It's it's all yeah. Well, it's not it's not right because 200 years ago that happened and so on and so on. Yeah, so that's true. I accept that, but that won't change this uh, this old fashioned old fashioned system. Uh, I know Vigo wants to say something. Can I answer very, very quickly? Because this weekend is about campaigning and how we can um, get people talking about the issues. I, I mean, I think the polling, the opinion polls in each country are fairly similar to each other, with the exception of Spain. And in Britain, people tell us um, the British monarchy is really popular. Everyone loves it. When you actually do a bit, a bit more digging, a bit more research, you find most people don't really care that much, and they are actually open to uh, persuasion. So there is a challenge there to then get through the media and get people listening to, to these issues. It's a big job, but that's the, that's the job of campaigning. On the, very quickly, on the popularities, you mentioned, I think you said that the Dutch monarchy is popular overseas. Uh, oh, in Germany. Right, no. Very, very popular in Germany. Look Possibly in Germany. Um, when you, I think, am I right in saying your queen abdicated a couple of years ago? Yeah. Um, and this made it onto the news in Britain, and the most common reaction in Britain was, we didn't know you had a monarchy. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. This is, uh, I know the Danes were being, you know, the Danes were being told that, um, you know, the Danish monarchy is good for Danish tourism, and they, I think you came up with a very good line about, you know, Dem the Danish monarchy is world famous in Denmark. And then, yes. uh, you know, I think that popularity is overinflated. Um, and it's not quite what it seems. So Tony Blair wasn't the one, uh, the only one who made this mistake. <laughs> there's, a, there's a big anecdote that when he met at some international conference, he met Beatrix. And she finally had some idea, I have seen her before. <laughs> he said, well, I am Tony Blair, etc., etc. I think he wasn't that prime minister, it was before yet, I think. So the mid 90s, and then she and he asked her, to her, Who are you? And she said, Well, I'm Beatrix. And then he asked, uh, Beatrix, who? <laughs> and she said, Well, uh, uh, just Beatrix, she answered. And, she, and then he asked, What are you doing? And then she said, I'm Queen of the Netherlands. And she apparently didn't know. So apparently, uh, there was the only one who didn't know. I, I had the, um, I had the um, opportunity of addressing the British Republican movement uh, two years ago. And I asked them, how many of you know that Denmark is a kingdom? Now, they were British Republicans, and they, I was invited, so they probably could deduct that. But, um, and also, people, people are, we're told that uh, it's good for tourism, and I, I bet a lot of tourists don't know that Denmark is a kingdom, if they know Denmark. 
Um, at your capital in Stockholm, huh? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> something to that effect. Um, but I wanted to say, and I thank you for that question, because it's very, very important. There are two things. What we've been studying here, as Graham said, is how to campaign. Because, and we talked about that, and Stefan and I, uh, my, my, um, the, 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 my, no, not code like the second chairman, what's the, Forget the vice chairman. We talked about that on the plane because there's a lot of idealism. I mean, many of us are idealists and can explain all the constitutional issues and all the democracy issues, but we've got to get our hands dirty and do some aggressive campaigning. And Graham is teaching us how to. <laughs> uh, and, and we tend to sort of fall in this and we want to talk about all the idealism and, and all the, the good reasons why Holland should have remained a republic. And those are very good reasons. But And one of the things you just did was talking about money. And we often talk, talk by, people would send us emails and say, don't talk so much about money, talk about democracy. Yeah. But I'll follow a journalistic advice called follow the money. <laughs> because it's like when you see all that, that money, it's, it's not so, I'm sure that Holland is a very rich country. And if you look at the Dutch state budget, the, what you give to the, the royals is not that much. But it's, it's just the principle. It's something yeah. crazy. And people will notice money. It's very good to get in the press. It's a, it's, it's a appear to be a weak argument because you always get the same answer. Well, if you take president, look at the states. They are expensive, much more expensive than. No, no, no. But, but that's no, it's end of the discussion. No, no, no. Oh, not at all. Not at all. No, no, no. You, you, you might be right. But yeah. the, the discussion will die. No, 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 no. It's the two things to that. First of all, you can easily prove. In Denmark, we pay uh, more to one of the royals. She's even divorced from a royal. She gets more a year than the German federal president. And Germany is 16 times the size of Denmark, right? I know. I but, but you can get that. You can get that in press. And I said it on TV that the, the, all the republics, the little republics around, are much cheaper. That's what, and you can get that in press. But it's also not so much about what the respondents say, what the journalists say, but you get to, people remember when you mentioned this about the money. It's a way to get noticed. And they remember, and it'll, it'll create attention. Anyway, you might. Have it, it, I mean, on, on the money thing, I mean, we get this. It, the point is, is that it, it, in terms of campaigning, yes, you're not going to go through a referendum and get rid of the monarchy because of how much it costs. But by going on about the money, what you do is you you create stories which the media will be interested in in uh, talking about. But also, it darkens the reputation of uh, the royals if they are starting to be seen as people who um, abuse their position by spending taxpayers' money on. Uh, private travel and holidays. I mean, Prince Charles spent £30,000 of taxpayers' money on a four-day holiday to Scotland, and that, that got in the, in the papers, you know. Now, and, and because we've had the MP scandal, where lots of MPs had to lose their job, and some of them uh, went to prison because of their abusing their expenses, we can now very simply say, well, one MP spends £10,000 of taxpayers' money on doing up his house, goes to prison. Prince Charles spends thirty thousand pounds four days a week, uh, four days holiday in Scotland, uh, and everyone excuses it. And that's not going to be enough to get rid of the monarchy. But what that does as a campaign is gets gets us into the media, gets people talking, and and does damage the reputation of the monarchy. And you know, get, I think we were saying before earlier that you know putting out a press release saying Republicans want a republic is not news, and it's not going to get you in the papers. But putting out something saying uh, the royal uh, abuses their uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, that is that is sort of news value. The thing about uh, republics being more presidents being more expensive, it seems novel when I say said on Danish TV that the Irish Republic is twenty four times cheaper than us. It, the, the journalists were like, "Oh, they never heard it before." Of course, it's, it's so it's a good. Point. That's right. You have to create a, a, an impression of novelty in the argument. Uh, we, one of our few successes in Belgium was when, uh, well, we, we used never to talk about money either because we thought that was very tricky. And then one day, um, a journalist asked us to. So, so uh, the, the 
the, the French-speaking television told us, well, you know, we'd like, we'd like your opinion about how much it costs because it's a, an argument that we hear very often from monarchists, uh, a republic which would be much, much more expensive. And so we did a study, and, and our Dutch colleagues may remember, I was invited once uh, to Amsterdam years ago, it must have been like in, in 2007 or something, or, or 2006, to talk about that. Um, we realized a study uh, where we compared Belgium with um, similar sized countries or countries with a similar state structure. So basically federal republics or small republics like Czechia uh, or the Czech Republic or Austria, Germany, not for its size but for its uh, federal structure, Switzerland. And actually um, using information from the embassies and from the ministries of those countries. So. Um, uh, information that couldn't really be questioned, you know, that the, the, the monarchist in Belgium could really say, oh, that's, that's not true, because it was uh, information from official sources. Um, we could prove that uh, our monarchy was, if you, um, if you take the size of the country into account, was uh, like, um, I don't really remember the, the figures for Germany, it's not that important, but that was three times more expensive than the German system, I think, uh, the German head of state, and a uh, hundred times more expensive than the Swiss head of state. And uh, actually, it was quite effectful because we never heard the argument again. And nowadays, still, monarchists Never say it was published in a few in a few um, papers in a few newspapers and magazines, and monarchists never uh, use that argument again. And also, you know, um, bringing into the debate that a republic can be something else than the United States of America and France is a very good idea because when you say republic, many people think of France or of the United States, but these are very special republics because they are presidential or semi-presidential republics. In most republics, you have a head of state and you have a prime minister, and those are two different functions. Um, well, in, in France, you have a prime minister too, but the, the, just the same, the president plays a very executive role, so it's, it's semi-presidential. And in, Amer in, the, in, the U, in the US, the president is the head of the government, uh, along with being the head of state. But that's very special. In most republics, you have the head of the government and the head of state. Of state, nobody can say who is the president of Germany most of the time. You know, they know uh, Angela Merkel. But they don't know. They don't know Joachim Gauck. Um, because because the president is a very discreet function and mostly representative. Um, and and it's it's a very good idea to draw to the attention to these facts and to to tell people that our countries would they become republics would most likely look like the Czech Republic or Switzerland or um, whatever, or Austria, uh, much more than they would uh, look like France or the United States of America. Okay. And it makes people think. Um, uh, yes. oh, thank you. Um, well, I'm still wondering um, about this discussion. I only heard two things. Uh, it's about the costs of the monarchy and the inheritance of the title. But if I look at a more abstract way, um, and from a perspective of economics, um, I say that the uh, European countries with um, uh, a monarchy are quite successful in an economic way. And I thought maybe there's a link um, because, uh, well, England is not very European. Eh? They, they, eh? they do not really want to be uh, to the European Union. Um, and if I look to the republics uh, in Europe, the only successful one we know is Germany. Finland. And Finland. Well, Two. Well, but Switzerland. Switzerland. But Switzerland is not part of the uh, European Union. No, but it's uh, However, um, uh, that's the first thing. So I, um, the other point is, if you look, at, you have the uh, World uh, Justice Platform, 
and uh, overseeing uh, 99 countries in the world in the way they are successful uh, in being uh, uh, having the rule of law. And they monitor the, the, all the countries in different ways, economic, social, uh, corruption, etc. etc. Um, and if you look to the big five countries um, that are the northern European, European countries, Sweden, uh, Norway, Holland, Finland, Denmark, um, and if you look to the uh, less successful um, monarchies, that is um, England, it's number 19, it's, um, and also Spain, number 25, well, okay. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, the most of the uh, successful countries in Europe are still the, mon the, the, the countries of the monarchy. And I'm still thinking that I do not trust politicians. Um, because yeah. who is checking the politicians? We, have, uh, we know that we have to divide the powers by um, Montesquieu. But well, my question is, why do we, do we uh, not have some inter-perspective? Um, fuse as a Republican to those powers because uh, there's uh, in the 19th century uh, Mr. Constant he was talking about um, the, uh, the neutral power pouvoir neutre and it's the, the oil in between um, the different uh, powers to rule so why can it not exist uh, beneath it um, together uh, the, in the way it is right now because it seems to be successful. False correlation. Uh, what's all the uh, yeah. Up? Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. question. Uh, I'd like to compliment the Dutch people for their productivity and their um, skills and uh, the wealth you have created for yourself. And uh, the reason you're admired for the things you do in the world is not because of your monarchy. It's putting the, the, uh, the cart in front of the horse, this, this argument. Uh, same thing with the stability. We talked about the stability of what we want. The stability of, if not Britain, the continental Northwest European countries has to do with the people in those countries, the, the skilled Dutch people, the good Swedes, the excellent Norwegians, the Belgians even. <laughs> <laughs> the division untold. The division untold. Yeah. Um, it is the skills of those people. And if you're tired of politicians, I am too. But I also admire politicians standing up, getting beaten, you know, many, many times and getting uh, a lot of aggressive questions from journalists arguing with your opponents in Parliament and so on. It's admirable. It, it requires skills, intelligence, and energy. But being a monarch, you can just lay back. Uh, and, and monarchy is political. I mean, monarchy is usually, somebody talked talk about oil. Uh, I think it was the Dutch monarchy involved with big business oil. Monarchy is involved with big business. Monarchy, monarchs are always political. Uh, like, I was looking at a colored magazine saluting our queen, Margaret, the Danish queen, and it was all her friends, and I was looking at her friends, and this is big business, so, and this is old nobility, so, and so. Very political. Uh, I really admire real politicians who, who are accountable for what they do, <laughs> and I'd love to have a president like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I, I think that the, the, the first point about, you know, trying to, this is quite a common thing that some monarchists um, throw at us about, you know, saying, look at all these social and economic measures, you know, it's monarchies at the top of the list. Um, and this goes back to the original point about stability. It's, you're putting it the wrong way around. You know, it's because they are stable and successful that the pressure hasn't built, um, built up to have a, a radical political overhaul. Um, and, but in no way can you say, well, you know, this country's economy is doing really well because we don't elect our head of state. That just doesn't make any sense. There's no mechanism there to explain that. Um, and you know, there's no way that Britain's economy is one of the largest in the world, despite being a sort of a middling-sized uh, country. That has nothing to do with a little old lady living in a big house in central London. So you know, there's no connection there uh, whatsoever. And my point, when people say I don't trust politicians, my my answer is 
if you don't trust politicians, you get rid of the monarchy. Because the monarchy is there to serve the interests of the politicians. Um, and our republic is all about limiting the power of politicians. And our politicians, certainly in, in Britain, uh, and I think this is more the case in Britain than, than elsewhere, there are almost no limits on the power of our politicians because the crown is the source of power and they have their hands on the crown. There's almost, there's literally, you're shaking, I don't know why you're shaking your head, but that is a constitutional fact in Britain. Um, yeah, well, maybe, but I mean, the point is that the monarchy is there to, to serve the, the interests of the, uh, of the politicians. And if you don't, if you don't like that, then, then have a republic. Because the, the whole concept, the principle, the values of republicanism is about limiting power and ensuring that the people are in charge. Okay, I think four or five hands go on, but I first <coughs> want to ask Thomas for a short reaction, and then five people, so let's be very brief in this. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. And first about the fall of republic. Uh, of course, you don't have to choose the American or the French one. It is, in fact, I think, very European to have this German or Finnish system. With, because in Latin, Latin America, there is also the American system, I would say. You chose the president who is in power and is governing. If you look at Brasilia, President Brazil, or Argentina, etc. If you look at Africa or else, only in, 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 in uh, only in Europe, I think you have this system that you make a, make a Israel diff difference uh, in, in Israel. Israel, yeah, uh, well, Israel, of course, is, a, is in fact is, is, is Europe overseas, so to say, in, in, in this respect. Uh, Switzerland is a case apart. Switzerland hasn't even an official president. It's a turning somebody every half year or every year, I think, something like that, who takes the presidency, so we don't need something else. Uh, about the monarch, uh, well, also, a lot of poor countries are monarchies. We don't talk about or, or very backward countries. Saudi Arabia is also a monarchy. Mm -hmm. Thailand is also a monarchy. I won't say this is very uh, example for us. So you can't make this simple difference that the, that the most, uh, most uh, advanced countries are monarchies and the, and the rest aren't. Uh, then the point is with these politicians. Uh, the idea that the monarch is some neutral person and this is some kind, in, in, in Holland, this, I think this idea is perhaps even stronger at the public than in other countries. This is this longing for some, some mother figure, I would say, well, we have now a father figure, but we have for a century, of course, a mother figure, always queens, who is neutral, who is, 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 is uh, uh, protecting us against the politicians, as if the monarch hasn't its own interests. They are doing as if they are neutral, but they have, of course, their own interests, and they are political, those interests. Uh, the the main po point with the monarchies is that, in fact, it's irrational. You have to fight some irrational force. I have been three times, I think, uh, I have met the, Dutch, the former Dutch queen and seen how people react when they are, where, when they are encountering a queen then they are somewhere hoping that something of this glory is always uh, is, is also helping to make themselves shine more. They are very impressed by this. And perhaps it's the paradox to say as a historian that people who are living in very small houses, which are the most of the people now on which are politicians, are much more impressed by a king with lackeys and a country house and a palace, then the parliamentarian elite of the 19th century, which had those country houses themselves because they are most poor, they are also impressed by this. And it's also the fact that the people are impressed by by this whole this whole fairy tale. And that's very difficult to fight that. It's a big problem, I think. Well, I wanted to, to say something about just Saudi Arabia, because Sweden finally got the foreign minister who said we shouldn't sell weapons to dictators, and it was a big mess, and Saudi Arabia got totally nuts with some other countries who thought it was bad of Sweden not to sell weapons to kill people. And then the king says, well, I got good relations with the king of Saudi Arabia. I'll just send him a letter, and he did. 
he is not allowed to involve in politics. And he did. The same king that gave a medal of honor to the king of Saudi Arabia, the same king that said that the Sultan of Brunei is a nice guy, his people is not hurting. I mean, come on. If, if he was elected, I would vote for him never to be elected again. But that's not my choice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, what I would uh, say about the Dutch situation is that the monarchy is not a point of discussion. So when we are talking about campaigning, we are here mo maybe uh, motivated to have a campaign. But for the rest, of it, it's very, very difficult. What I uh, experienced myself is that uh, one of those nice princesses that married a prince, that she was interested in schooling low-lettered people. And she came to my school and she uh, was very interested. And one year later I discovered that a big lot of money from the whole budget that was reserved for low-lettered people was allocated to this princess because she wanted to start a foundation for helping those low littered people, which, which we already did. And then I asked in a meeting, um, is this taking out the money, which is legally uh, for the schools who do this kind of work, is this discussed in a parliament? And even this question was not allowed to be taken up into the, uh, the minutes of this meeting. So it is all silent. And as soon as you try to discuss this, when you want to put it in newspaper, you know that your school will be um, in problems by getting money from people who still want you to do this work. And so lots of money are going there and you have to be, and now I'm not working in the school anymore, so I have more space to, to kind of um, make it clear that this is, this is really horrible budget picking <laughs> and, and not good for people. But it's, it's really very, very tricky. And still, it, it, it's one of the things that you think people in the Netherlands should accept this, but it doesn't work. May I react to that? Sure. Uh, we've been talking about something we call the balance of sympathy today, because the royals are very good at thieving sympathy. Yeah. Now, I really love and admire, I'm a teacher too, by the way, I love and admire people who do something, some uh, out of idealism for maybe a, a modest pay to make the lives of others better. And I, I'm so appalled when the royals steal the honor. And I wasn't aware that it could be done in such a bad way. In Denmark, it's mostly they steal the honor, they don't steal from the, the actual budget. Um, and they're very good at positioning themselves in a uh, position where you can't be criticized. Our crown princess does something for reproductive rights in the U some UN body, where she shouldn't be sitting, because her only legitimacy is being a crown princess where her, the rights to her body almost belongs to the country, producing heirs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but, but I, I really, really resent when they steal the honor. And, and it's, this is what they do. It's a way to legitimize themselves is by being in different charities and doing this for that, and it steals the honor for, for the good people who do the work. But and up to that stealing the money is even worse. Mm -hmm. Say again? Up to that stealing the money from the teachers who did that work before. And that's even worse. I mean, I've, I've, I haven't heard a case as bad as that. But, but thanks for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> thanks. I would like to emphasize who would like to pose a question, uh, also in relation to time. So, uh, there's a hand over there. Uh, just emphasizing one. Uh, who else? Two. Um, I have to say, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Also, one last Three one. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll <coughs> 
Dank u wel. Een short uh, question voor Graham en voor Thomas. Uh, Thomas, je zei uh, in je speech dat uh, um, um, when uh, Napoleon should reach uh, England, should reach the British Kingdom, that there should be a difference with uh, now, with later. But I think it's not. And I like to hear from Graham and for, from Thomas why. Because when Napoleon went to, uh, to England and should have the power there, he should send his sister or his brother to be a king or a queen over there. And it will be the same with later. And later on, when he fall down, then um, yes, the English uh, queen should, or king should come back again. So please give your arguments to it. Well, uh, it's of course what if history, uh, but if you see, I won't say that England would be a republic. That's not what I'm arguing. I was arguing that when England would be conquered by Napoleon, a lot of other medieval institutions were, would be get rid of because then French law and French system would be imposed and then I, as it is not in a lot of other countries. I mean, uh, we were a republic, but before the French came, but we were a democratic republic. We were a very ancient, fashioned republic. It was ancient ancien regime. And that was the whole of Europe. And the French occupation and the French conquering of the rest of Europe has made an end to that. In a lot of countries are modernized thanks to the, conquer, the conquering of by Napoleon, that doesn't mean that it, that it ended immediately as democracy, but something like, I, I think something like the, the, the House of Lords and a lot of other See, I, things I, I, yeah. wouldn't exist anymore in this, in this I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. No, very, very briefly, in 1066 the French invaded Britain and, and stayed there and we just adapted. And then in 1689 the Dutch invaded Britain in the so-called Glorious Revolution and we adapted. And then a few years later we brought the German uh, monarchs in and, uh, and again we adapted. And then we carried on pretending that they, it was all one continuous line of English, uh, English kings and queens. So. Um, and, the, and the thing is, the House of Lords, the Parliament, you know, that's all uh, been uh, survived um, because the, the powerful families and the elites um, wanted it to survive. So, yeah, we, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a what if, it's, it's an interesting yeah, uh, conversation. But I, I, uh, I, I don't know that it necessarily gets us very far in terms of getting rid of what we have now. We do have a feudal, medieval um, set of institutions, absolutely. We have the most absurd upper house. I mean, we have an upper house where uh, we have bishops. Britain is one of two countries where we have state clerics in our parliament, the other one being Iran. Um, we, have, we have 92 hereditary lords who ironically are the only ones who have elections for members of the House of Lords. So if one of those 92 dies, the other 91 elect someone else to come in and replace them from amongst um, hereditary lords. And then we have um, a whole load of party, um, political party donors given places in the House of Lords. Uh, XMPs and so on, uh, uh, and that is you know, that is an institution that's been around a long time. But I, I yeah, I um, sort of going back to one of the other earlier questions as well is that you know the, these things are um, quite well entrenched. Um, there's a lot of political opposition. There's a lot of assumption about um, uh, uh, public support, and it can sometimes sometimes seem. Uh, that everybody else, you know, everything is kind of an obstacle, and everybody else is is uh, you know in support of the monarchy but it does come down to you know, sort of getting out there causing trouble making noise uh, getting people talking about it and things do change uh, for your campaign quite quickly um, and uh, and then when you start to make a lot more noise you start to realize that actually a lot of other people in the country um, also do uh, do agree with you or at the very least are open-minded about having that uh, having that conversation it's just a, a, a bit of a response to the, the previous question about uh, you know about how uh, challenging you can see in terms of uh, the sort of obstacles you get um, to to raising questions about the monarchy. But it, it does need the leadership of, of the campaign to, to kind of create that space and make it safe uh, for you to, to raise those questions. Okay, um, uh, I think uh, with the nine o'clock... Uh, can I please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, there was someone over there and... Uh, okay, uh, yeah, Peter and... You want to be the last one? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, it seems that um, uh, people in power are um, helped by living in obscurity. We're looking at, at the, here at the, at the um, monarchies and from the outside. I was just thinking that maybe it would be very good to put together a very good questionnaire to, for the monarchies to answer. I mean, you could do that via your um, um, uh, government and say, well, uh, we would like, since uh, we are in, uh, in an era where we'd like to have more clarity in, in, where, in what is happening in the world and, 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 and see through uh, particular situations, like, look at this questionnaire. We would like to know what the monarchy themselves, monarchs themselves or their family, think of their position because they have sometimes a problem with um, um, uh, all this publicity and that they have no private life and so on. Well, maybe they don't like their position and therefore would be helped by updating. Or if they like it very much, you could ask, so how much would you like to fork to keep your position? You know, from another side, ask the monarchs what they like. And, yeah. I think they like. I, I think they quite like being monarchs. Well, is the, uh, then why? What are, what is? I, I I like the idea, although it's going to be challenging to implement it. I am. Um, every time the monarchs are shine, the light really comes on them. They lose because they, they do something crazy, or their children do something crazy. If you're told from childhood that you're so beautiful and wonderful, mm -hmm. if you go to the loo, if you do something banal, you, you get uh, a misjudgment of yourself. So it actually helps us when the royals are exposed more, because eventually they'll do something stupid. Okay. And uh, talk about time, shall I? I think this is the last question. Yes. Okay. Just very briefly, coming back to the uh, Department of History at Leiden University, um, where I'm teaching in European Studies, just to tell you that I've asked my students, and some are monarchists and some are republicans, I know, can you please devise for me, for the class, uh, on the occasion of King's Day, uh, a plan of action? for uh, getting under European democracy uh, principles uh, how to go about to abolish uh, the monarchies in the European Union. I'm not sure uh, whether we get good suggestions, but at least I'm looking forward to the discussion with my students. I'm not sure that we can change the whole faculty. Yeah. So, I really like that idea. I'm looking forward to it. I am. Um, I, I mean, I've said before when it was raised that maybe we should get the European Union to do something like this. If, if Britain heard the European Union saying you can't have the monarchy, then Britain would leave the European Union. It's that simple. Um, <laughs> now, what if you win? What should I do? Yeah, I, well, to, to my mind, um, this is all about being um, creating new democracies, um, and I think new democracies need to be created from the bottom up by uh, by the people of that country to um, uh, you know to sort of taking a stand and making a democratic decision to do it. And it has to be through the democratic decision rather than through the European Union. But it, I mean, it's an interesting exercise, uh, nonetheless, but I think it has to be a national-based, bottom-up uh, movement. It's a serious joke I'm doing with them. Yeah. I, I'd love to thank the, the good Dutch people for teaching us stuff here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I have a last question. I understand that you, being all together here, must have uh, called them in media, and uh, uh, I think we can make use of that. Just to give an example, the wealth of our royal family is about 10 billion. Uh, so they save each year about 300 million by not paying tax. Maybe it is good as each country of you could establish that same, and we are going to publish uh, those, those figures. Uh, as, as a result of being together, as, as one, one example. Uh, I think those figures are more or less now. 
a, a, a remark. If the campaign starts, it's good to start it in Amsterdam because in Amsterdam the Herengracht comes before the Kaiser's and the Prince. Explain that. Okay, um, there is a kind of hierarchy in the uh, canals, and they are you know located in a certain way. And the most important canal is the canal, the Herengracht, and then only the Kaiserschacht comes. So in the Netherlands, uh, the... What is the Heerenkracht? The Heerenkracht. The Gentleman's, Gentleman's Canal. In Amsterdam. More important than the Emperor Canal. More important than the Prince Canal. So there is... <laughs> okay. Well, that might be my uh, thing to end this uh, meeting. I thank you all for participating in uh, the discussion. I want to thank uh, Thomas for his reading. I want to thank all the members of the European Republican Associations uh, uh, organizations uh, for their uh, participation. Keep in mind the idea that uh, every problem that you all have with uh, the monarchy is not a prerogative of the Netherlands. It's uh, shared with uh, all these other countries and I think that's something that would send us to the kind of optimism. I mean, the problem is recognized. Uh, thank you all for being here and let's have a drink uh, right now.